Hey, welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man that wants to remind everyone that any size glass can be a shot glass. It's Dale. You damn right. Yep. <laughs> Big shot, little shot, side shot. Oh yeah, it's all a shot. Yeah. Just to turn it up and go. That's it. <laughs> What's going on, dude? What's going on with you? I'm right. Glad to be recording an episode, man. Yeah, man. After a little time off last week, we had a we had a pretty good time, didn't oh, we? Oh, we had a great time. Yeah, we'd like to give a shout out to our buddies down at Recycle Canteen down there at, uh, at Bicycles in Shelby. Uh, thanks to our buddies, uh, Sandy Carlton, uh, Scott Moss, Brian McMurray, Kevin Bridges, and Trey Hill, man. We all met up with all them dudes, and it was a, it was a really good time, wasn't it? Had a beer and listened to good music. We met a lot of folks, give really? out some stickers, had, a, had some fans come up and hit us up and stuff, and man, it was cool. It's amazing. We can wear our crack house shirts out somewhere, and people just come up and talk to us, say... <laughs> What is that for? What is that? <laughs> we Googled you. Yeah, we just Googled <laughs> You've that. You've been Googled, Donnie. What is that? <laughs> That's cool. How do we listen to that? Yeah. No, really. People come up to us and talk to us, and yeah, it was great. It was a fun time. Handing out some stickers and different things. And, Get some guitar picks. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff, man. I loved it. We got to have a beer and just chill out. Yeah. It was a good, it was a good time. Yeah, we had Keep a good Keep back and have a good night. Yeah, we're glad to get back in the crack house and do another episode. Yeah, sorry we didn't let you know, but it was just kind of one of them weeks where uh, I had a lot of stuff to do and Donnie had a lot of stuff to do, and we just said, let's just go sports, Sandy, and have a good night. Yeah. Chill. We can do that because this is our podcast, That's so right. we can do that. That's right. Yep. You got any good shout-outs for us, man. Yeah, I got to do a little few here. Uh, give a shout-out to... Uh, Christy Potts Page. She went on uh, Facebook and gave us a recommendation. Oh, Facebook recommendation. Yeah, man. That was cool, wasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, y'all slackers need to jump on there like Christy Potts Page did. And we'd like to give a shout out to uh, Lisa Marie Davis. I think she just found her page and been liking up a bunch of stuff. And blew it up today. Blew it up today and joined the Crack House family, and we appreciate you. I got on Facebook earlier today and saw all those notifications like, yeah, she wants a shout out. Heck yeah, and she's got one. Yep. It ain't hard. Anybody can do it. That's right. Just get off your butt and do something. Mm-hmm. Do some little clicking around. <laughs> get it going. Yep. All right. You got anything else before people get mad? I want to remind everybody to go on to Apple Podcast and rate and review. That's right. Like Bizarre Nate. Five star. Five star. Five star Bizarre. Bizarre. <laughs> and his wife did it too. That's right. Yep. Mm-hmm. So Bizarre Nate gets another shout out. He does. He's yeah. like at the top of the list. He is. I've never met Bizarre Nate, but... I just yeah. like saying bizarre Nate. So. Well, you need to. He's a cool dude. Yep. <laughs> I have to check him out. And everybody go to the store page and get you a t-shirt, get you some kind of merchandise, support the crack house, and yeah. help keep the lights on. And if you want to drop some money in the gas tank. We appreciate that, too. Absolutely. Or, or just tell a friend and whatever. Yes. Just word of mouth. Word of mouth support. We appreciate you. Tell man. everybody. Tell them all. All right, Dale. We're going to get into our episode, well, man. Let's do that. And this week, we are covering the case of Carla Faye Tucker. Carla Faye. Carla Faye. Carla Faye. <laughs> I wonder if they called her Carla Faye or they just called her Carla. The only one is pissed off. I bet so. <laughs> yeah, when your mama's mad at you, she's going to call you by your full name. Yeah, you think you're a serial killer. <laughs> Get the full three-name treatment. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, Carla Faye Tucker was born on November 18th, 1959 in Houston, Texas. To parents Larry and Carolyn Tucker. Well. Yep. And Carla's dad, he was a what, Dale? He was a longshoreman. Exactly. <laughs> he was a longshoreman. What does a longshoreman do? Uh, they go where a short shoreman can't. Yeah. I think they're kind of like a dock worker for waterfront. Yeah, I don't know. Kind of thing. Unloading ships and trucks and trains and stuff like that i think that's what they do yeah just from doing research we've heard long shoreman yep. a whole lot <laughs> so i figured we had to shout it out too. yeah we had to shout it out <laughs> yeah. but from the get-go dale carla's life man from a young age was just turbulent her mom and dad fussed all the time they would divorce they would remarry divorce and remarry and carla was in her later years quoted as saying that when they get back together life was great but when they would divorce, it would just it would just be rough. Yeah, just be rough on her. But Carla was the youngest of three sisters. By the time Carla was eight years old, she got smoking cigarettes. Yep. And I think she called her sisters smoking. Yep. And she was going to tell on them. Yeah. So I think they were smoking. They might have been smoking something else too. They might have been smoking some weed too. Yeah. But she was going to tell them, and then they <clears> put a cigarette in her hand and made her smoke it, and said, "Well, you can't tell now because you're doing it too." That's right. Yeah. Smart, ain't it? No, yeah, very smart. Be, be young little girls like that. 
from an early age, Dale, she always wondered why she was dark headed and her two older sisters were blonde headed. Mm -hmm. Yep. But during Carla's parents' divorce proceedings, when she was 10 years old, Carla learned that her birth was the result of an extramarital affair. Yeah, and it was pretty, pretty shitty how she found out, too. It was basically like going over and sat on his lap. That's your real daddy. Yeah, he was there. And I was like, what? So now she has always wondered, you know, about uh, why she looked so much different than her, than her sisters did. Because they were like, what, pale and blonde-headed? Yeah. And, and she, she was, was a little dark, dark-eyed, dark, dark skin girl yeah so it make you wonder wouldn't it so she's been screwed up from from the get-go yep and i think at that early age after the divorce she was living with her dad he got custody of them yeah and things wasn't going well for them at all no uh, i don't think nobody was listening no nope. and she went to live with her mother yeah he couldn't get them to do anything or couldn't he couldn't deal with them. He'd take them to school, and they'd go in the front door and right out the back door and everything. Finally, I think he just said to hell with it and just sent her to her mama's home. Yep. And Carl was caught by her mom one day rolling a joint. Mm-hmm. And What'd she do? And, and she thought her mama would fuss at her. Yeah. But actually, she fussed at her for not rolling it correctly. Yeah, if you're going to do it, here, let me show you how to do exactly. it Exactly. Right. Do it right. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, hell, you are 12. What do you know? I mean, really. By the age of 12... Carla began taking drugs and having sex mm -hmm. by the age of 12. Well, you know, they were hanging around with a lot of seedy people. I think uh, bikers and stuff were dropping by, and her older sisters were seeing that we're hanging out with lots of older people. And the uh, story is that uh, one day one of the biker guys come by to see the sisters, and they weren't home, and nobody was home but Carla. And uh, so he took her a ride on the motorcycle and ended up giving her heroin because he, I think he was going to try and uh, take advantage of her. When she was she was twelve, mm -hmm. and anyway, shot her up full of heroin and ended up getting real sick. So I don't know if he if he got to do what he wanted to do that day or not. But yeah, so that's pretty much how all this how you go from smoking pot to straight to heroin when you're twelve years old. Yeah, and it had been reported that she lost her virginity at the age of twelve. Yeah, so I'm sure somewhere yeah. in there. Right? So that's pretty damn sad. It sure. is. Yes, her life as a young girl was just. In turmoil. It's man. like grew up now. Yeah. No time for kid stuff. Yep. And then she dropped out of school at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. And this one, she got to follow her mother, Carolyn, as a rock groupie and even into prostitution. Yep. Sex, and, sex working. Yep. <laughs> and they were following bands around like the Almond Brothers, the Marshall Tucker Band, and even the Eagles. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even her mom was pushing her into doing sex work. You yeah, know, if that's what you can call it at and, 14. And instructing and, her how to do it. And getting money. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Great parenting, huh? Very great parenting, man. If you're not going to go to school and you're going to roll joints, that's what you're going to do. <laughs> yep. Get some heroin and, well, and some stuff. Yeah. And by the age of 16, Carla got married. Well, she was briefly married to a mechanic named Stephen Griffith. Yeah. But there's not much on this marriage. I don't know how long it lasted or if they... Got an annulment, or I don't know what happened. Yeah, I don't there's no that. not much report on that. But she well, was married at the age of 16. Well, I think he was into drugs, and she was into drugs, so it was kind of like maybe he was working so he could buy them for her. Probably so. Know. And when she was in her early 20s, she got to hanging out with bikers again, and she met a woman named Sean Dean. And her husband, his name was Jerry Lynn Dean. And they introduced her. In 1981, to a man named Daniel Garrett, but everybody called him Danny. Right. Danny Garrett. And when she was 21 years old, uh, Carla started dating Danny. Yeah, I think he was a Vietnam vet, wasn't he? He was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and from right off the bat, you know, um, I don't think she liked uh, Jerry Lynn Dean, who was um, Sean's husband. They just, he didn't sit right. You know, the first time she ever met him, he went over and this dude had drove his motorcycle up in her, her house. Yeah, he had it parked in her house. Parked in the living room. There was dripping oil and stuff everywhere. And mm -hmm. said, she'd come in and raising hell about it, and he didn't care. And he wouldn't want to take it out. And I think she she might have punched him even that day. Yeah, they, it's uh, been reported that Carla could fight. Yeah, it said, you know, her ex-husband or whatever said that she had hit him harder than than any man had ever hit him. So that's probably why they ain't know about that marriage. They probably got hit a little bit. Because, yeah. cause, you know, if you're raised on the road, she's going to be learning how to survive, you know, it's either mm. that or die, and she's pretty tough. Hit hard. Yeah. So, 
yeah, they didn't get along at all, and uh, they had uh, always butted heads since that day. And uh, her and her her boyfriend always tried to tell Sean she needed to get rid of this guy because he just wasn't good. Mm-hmm. And uh, ended up one day he punched Sean in the face. Yeah, and uh, she she swore she was going to leave, so she had moved in with with Carla. All right, Dale, we're going to move just a little bit forward to. Oh, this is on a Monday, June the fourteenth, nineteen eighty three. Okay. And Carla was having a weekend of doing drugs. Yeah. It was like a three day bender with her boyfriend Danny. Yeah, and there was a lot of people there. It was a big party. They were having a big bender there and then there were people coming in and out and the motorcycle gang guys and just other random friends. And doing a lot of drugs. Lots of drugs. They were And uh they'd been enforced for about three days and then it was in a small brick house in Houston, Texas. And there, Carla lived with, like I said, her 37-year-old boyfriend, Danny Garrett. And they even described Danny as a pill doctor. Hmm. That was his nickname. Yeah, the night of that party, Dale, they were taking tons of drugs. I mean, they were taking heroin, Valium Speed, Percodan, Mandrex. They were smoking marijuana, taking Dilaudid, Methadone, drinking tequila and rum. Yeah, I think I also had some whiskey and some beer and some cocaine. So I think it could go each way, whichever way they wanted to go. It yeah. Probably a lot. It's, I don't, it's just crazy. That's just, that's yeah. a lot. That's a lot of drugs. Mm. So, so this particular night on June the 13th, they were taking all these drugs. And Carla and Danny, this is when they went to Jerry Dean's apartment. Yeah. After spending this whole weekend doing these drugs with her boyfriend, Danny, and some of their friends, Tucker and Garrett entered Jerry Dean's home about 3 a.m. You know, they had been talking about it all night, and uh, how, how it came about is they were, you know, most people had left, but they they weren't done partying, so they just kept talking about what they were going to do and what they were going to do. And uh, Sean was in and out, you know. she was Sometimes she was happy, sometimes she was mad at him, you know, about because she loved the guy or whatever. But Carla was wanting to get back at But Carla Jerry. wanted to get back at him, so the idea was they were going to go steal his motorcycle. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, that's the only way they knew they could get back at him. Now, when she left, uh, she took an extra set of keys, but she had lost them, or she thought. But Tucker had found them and kept them. Mm-hmm. She just kind of thought they were lost. So they decided they were going to go over there and steal his motorcycle and maybe even his car. But they didn't know if he's going to be home or not. So anyway, they got all messed up. I was going to say something else. They were all messed up. And, uh, that's they were when they, high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> high, high. <laughs> That's when they decided to go on over to the, to Dean's apartment complex. That's just a long way of saying that, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. So anyway, th- when they got over there, um, one of them started looking for his El Camino while the other two d- uh, snuck into the apartment using the keys so they could just slide right in. Mm-hmm. So when they go in, and then uh, guess what? His motorcycle's in the living room. Yeah, sitting in the living room. Yeah, so they start. But it's uh looks like he'd been working on it, which, you know, that's not unusual, you know, especially if a lot of biker guys keep their motorcycles in the living room, do donuts in the living room, all kind of crazy stuff I've seen. So, uh, but anyway, he'd been working on it, so he got tools and parts laying around and stuff. So they start grabbing up some stuff, and that's when they hear him in the, something come from the bedroom asking who in the hell's in the house. Yeah, and they go in the bedroom. Yeah. And actually, Carla sits on Jerry Dean. Yeah. He was like laying on a mattress or whatever and was starting to get up, and she run and jumps on him and sitting on him. But he's trying to protect himself. And, yeah. And Jerry Dean grabbed Carla above the elbows. Right. And this is when Danny Garrett intervened. Yeah, he just looked around and he grabbed up a ball paint hammer and smashed him in the back of the head. Yeah. Several times. Several times. And it had been reported that he actually loosened his head from his neck yeah unhinged i think yeah unhinged god dang yeah it's crazy yeah you know and you know that would cause all his breathing passages to fill up with with fluid and start gurgling and all that mess and said uh he was making a gurgling sound yeah it was really bad and then getting on carla's nerves yeah probably you know they're all jacked up on speed and everything else and whatever they be doing because you know they were shooting everything they can do Mm -hmm. and uh not with a gun, with a needle, <laughs> shooting, <laughs> shooting all them drugs. That's what I should have said. Anyway, so that was really getting on her nerves. So she's like, "You're gonna have to do something to stop that gurgling noise. It's driving me crazy." And he, it's been a quoted that he said that it sounded like a, a fish aquarium that was broken. Yeah, it was just that no, I just can't imagine. So this is when Carla picks up a three foot pickaxe. Yeah, it was leaning against the wall. Yeah, he and was, the reason he had a pickaxe. Yeah. Uh, 
Go ahead. Yeah, the reason he had a pickaxe was he worked for the cable company. Yeah. And I guess he just dig ditches, you know. Yeah, dug lines for cable wire. Right, so that that'd be the reason it was laying in there. But Carla picked up that three foot pickaxe and began hitting Jerry Dean with it. Yes. And hit him in the chest. He hit him what, twenty something times. I yeah, think. about twenty eight times. Twenty eight times. Yeah. And this stopped the gurgling noise, I uh, bet. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But Danny Garrett left the bedroom and he just continued loading uh Jerry Dean's motorcycle parts into his four ranchero. Right. Now there was a third guy with him that one one that went looking for the uh, El Camino to begin with and said, you know, he come in and looked in and he looked over and seen Tucker and she had her foot on uh on Jerry pushing it to try to use it for leverage to pull the pickaxe out of him. So, yeah. And he looked over him and smiled real big and then kept hacking. Yeah. And that guy said, hell with this, and he left. He, yeah. He didn't I wouldn't want no part of this. I thought we were still on the motorcycle. We, we, you know, he just ran. I don't want none of this. Yeah, I don't blame him. Yep. And while uh, Danny was out there loading motorcycle parts and stuff, Carla was still in the bedroom, and Dill, she noticed something moving over in the corner. Yeah. And over in the corner – it was a, uh, I guess, a blanket or bedspread type. Yeah, she just hid under some bed covers, yeah. Yep. And this was Deborah Thornton. Yeah, it was a woman. Yeah. So she had been there the whole time. And the reason she was there is that she had argued with her husband the day before. Yep. And went to a party and ended up spending the, the night with uh, Jerry Dean. Yeah, she had just met him. Yeah, and they were just hanging out. Hmm. Yeah, so she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, I'm telling you. But when um, Carla found her, Carla picked up the pickaxe and... Smashed it into her shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, they began, they were fighting around, you know, over the and everything. And, and then that's when Garrett come back in and he separated them, you know, a little bit. And and then so she started hitting her again with that pickaxe. And uh, said that the woman said, you know, that while they were trying to figure out what they were going to do, with this woman, they decided, well, she knows her name. She knows what we look like. Yeah, they've got seen us. Yeah. yeah. So, while it's just hitting her, said to, or apparently the, the lady, Deborah, said that uh, this is really hurting. If you're going to kill me, do it quick. Get it over with, yeah. Good God. Man. And so, they were going at it pretty hard, you know. And uh, she hit her, and they went back there, and, and uh, they started stealing some stuff, or, you know, packing up stuff. And then that's when they realized she wasn't dead. And that's when Thornton went back in there and, and took it, raised it over his head, and, and smashed it right through her heart, left it embedded in her, and I'm I'm figuring it's in the floor too, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's what killed her. So and it was later where she said she testified, you know, that she experienced intense orgasms with each blow of the pickaxe. Wow. And that's crazy. Yeah. Because you never hear women saying that. I just wonder if she did. I don't know. I mean, why would she say it if she didn't? Yeah, I mean, they, they say there's a... Of course, it could have been the drugs and a lot of other... And, and they the, say there's a, uh, there's a link between sex, sex and, and violence. Yeah. yeah. So who knows? You know, you hear that a lot with serial killers and stuff, you know, that that happens. Yeah. But, so, guess I could. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But they left. Yeah, they packed up all the stuff and, and left. Mm-hmm. And then they went back to... They stole his money and car and left. Yeah, his wallet and everything. And it was the next morning, this was a... Jerry Dean's co-worker, this guy by the name of Gregory Scott Traver, he discovered the bodies. Yeah, he was a uh, he worked with uh, Dean. Yeah, and uh, they always uh, carpool. So when he didn't show up to pick him up for work, he walked over to his apartment. I guess they lived in the same complex or somewhere pretty close. Because he had walked over and knocked on the door to tell him he's get his ass up. You know, we're late for work, and the door was open, and he went in and he found all the, the carnage. <sighs> That'd be pretty rough on him. It would. Yeah, once they discovered the bodies, Dale, an investigation began. It didn't take long for law officers to connect the bodies to the killers, and the cops learned with Carla Fay and Danny of what they had done. And, hell, they had bragged about what they had done. Yeah. And the police started getting rough, and everyone who knew anything talked. And Danny's brother talked, too. And Carrie Tucker talked. Sean talked. Even Jimmy Liebrand, when he was nabbed. And he hadn't been involved. He was the one that walked out. Hmm. Yeah, and he said, I waited outside for what was supposed to have been a burglary. Right. So, yeah, he didn't He didn't have anything to do with it, but, yeah, he talked. Now, Dale, the morning after all this happened, Carla Fay showed up at the home of Doug Garrett at, at approximately 6.30 a.m. in a blue El Camino. Yeah. 
And after unloading a motorcycle frame from the back of the El Camino, she said, we offered Jerry Dean last night. And she told him that Garrett had hit him with a hammer. But she had picked him. And even received sexual gratification from it, from mm. every stroke. And she even handed him Dean's wallet, which Doug immediately burned in the ashtray. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah. And Doug insisted that they remove the motorcycle parts from his garage at that time. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. And he later allowed his brother to store some of the parts with him. Right. And he disposed of the parts before going to the police, but led the police to them at a later date. Yeah, I think he got scared because I think, you know, they were talking about doing some stuff. And there was rumors that uh, they were even talking about often the two, the couple of people who helped them, mm-hmm. you know, because they were already getting big. Like, well, we'll go rob some drug houses and we'll take them out and we'll kill everybody and we'll take the money and then we'll take the drugs. And then yeah. there was rumors they would talk about maybe they would kill the people who helped them that night. Just mm-hmm. so nobody would say anything. But meanwhile, they were telling everybody they knew what they had done. And like we said, the bodies were discovered by Jerry Dean's co-worker, mm-hmm. uh, Scott Traver. And this was that morning, June 13th. And this is when Dean didn't arrive to work. And Traver found Dean's body in the spare bedroom along with the body of a girl with a pickaxe in her heart. And Traver also noticed that Dean's motorcycle was missing and the television had been moved. And the radio was turned wide open. Yep. Yeah, and I think um, he got, you know, he let him store some stuff there for a while, but then he took it and threw threw a bunch of it in the river, and then he got really weirded out about it, and uh, that's when he went to the cops. Yep. And I think what happened is him and uh, an investigator were friends way before this, and uh, I don't think they had been close, you know, because they, were, he was, they had <laughs> went their separate ways apparently. But uh, one of the cops had heard that he was involved and called his ex-wife and asked him what's going on. And she goes, well, he's definitely not the guy that you used to know. And she said, he, so he told her, told the ex-wife, to said, well, you have him call me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she called him back in a couple of days and said that they wanted to come and meet and talk to him. And said that uh, he basically told him, so well, anything you're going to tell me, just remember, you know, it could send him to death row. And they said they didn't care because they were scared for their life. So that's when they told them everything that they knew about the motorcycle parts and everything they had told them about the murder. And uh, so then he suggested that they wear a wire and see if you could get them to admit it, you know, to you on. So we have a recording. And uh, he agreed and said they coached him up to what to say and said that uh, he went in there and just knocked it out of the park, basically got them to talk, said basically had a two-hour recording and pretty much them telling everything they had done and pretty good detail mm-hmm. and then so they had a full admission on tape and so yeah. even they had some of the the da and stuff was in the, the recording van outside and as soon as they had heard enough they told them to go on in there and arrest them then before they got away and they heard the guy that's doing the uh the tape said well i'm i gotta go i gotta get out here so i can get to work and as soon as he went out they went in and got him and mm-hmm. said at this point they were still a bunch of uh as they called them, drug heads or drug kids, <laughs> all in there partying. And at this point, and they just went in there and picked them up, no problem. Yep. And then said when uh, they were riding down to the station, that even Carla was riding with him, and they were talking, and he's like, she's just shooting the shit with him, like you know, well, where do you live? And oh, well, I used to live near there, and just like, just like it's another day. They're just going, just going for a ride. <laughs> yeah, we're just going for a ride. <laughs> Been picked up for double homicide. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Now, in, in September of 1983. Carla Faye Tucker and Danny Garrett were indicted for murders and tried separately for their crimes, Dale. And uh, Carla was charged with the murders of both uh, Jerry Dean and Deborah Thornton. But she later testified against Danny Garrett at his trial. Yeah. And the charge for murder of Thornton was dropped. Yeah, but it's kind of weird, because, you know, she had already been convicted yeah. you know, in her trial and given... Uh, but they dropped the charges. Yeah, definitely. I guess so. She could, she would testify against Danny Garrett. Yeah, but what good? It didn't do her any good. Yeah, it didn't do her better good. I mean, she still, she still was on death row. Yeah. But yeah, she wasn't charged with uh, Thornton's death, and uh, Carla entered a plea of not guilty and was jailed awaiting trial. And soon after being in prison, Carla took a Bible from the prison ministry, Dale. Yeah, I think he come in and had them come into a meeting or whatever and had some <laughs> Bibles and stuff sitting there. And she didn't know they were bringing them for them, so she stole one and <laughs> took it back with her. Yeah. Yeah, and said she just didn't know what she was, you know. What she was reading or anything. Right. And said before she knew it, she was in the middle of, the, of her cell floor on her knees, just asking, asking God to forgive her. Yep. And Carla Faye Tucker became a Christian in October of 1983. Mm-hmm. 
this is just her next month. Yeah, just yeah. months, yeah. But if you think about it, man, this is probably the first time she's been somewhat, well, I guess completely sober since yeah. she was 12. If I you know. think, because, yeah. you know, if they jacked her up on heroin then, I'm sure she's been, and even in that recording, you know, I heard a part of, you know, the, the two hour recording, I've heard a clip of it, and you could tell she's really fried on there. Yeah. But she can probably see it a little clearer, a little clearer here. Yep. Because, um, one of them asked her on the, uh, on the wire if they asked her if, if she'd killed him. That's when she said, hell yeah. Because mm-hmm. you know she was screwed up, man. Oh, yeah. It's awful. Yeah. But I think I think Carla was very impressionable. You know? Yeah. You know, I think it was good that she found God and got religious and all that stuff. And But I think whatever she was around, she was just very impressionable. Yeah. Speaking of that, hell yeah, you know, the defense guy got her on that because he's like when he was doing his final – whatever and uh we said do you think she deserves deserves the uh, death penalty and then he walked over and pushed play and he said hell yeah yeah that so was, was brilliant like, yeah yeah so while carla was on death row she was incarcerated at mountain view unit in gatesville texas and she became texas department of criminal justice death row inmate number 777 that's pretty wild ain't it yep you know and it's crazy all this going on um you know you know, she married the prison minister. Yep. You know, it was just kind of a weird, weird ceremony inside the prison, but they did it over the phone. Yeah. Through a glass wall. They never touched. Not even. They never did. Held, held hands or anything. Yep. You know, because of Texas law, there's no conjugal visits, no nothing. So they never hold hands, no no kiss, no nothing, ever. But he was the um, prison minister. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. You know, and then. Now, though the death penalty was hardly ever sought for female defendants. Uh, Carla Fay, along with Danny Garrett, was sentenced to death in late 1984. Right. But Danny Garrett died in prison of liver disease in 1993, so he never got his uh, yeah. sentence right. fulfilled. Yeah, I think he was getting ready to have uh, some kind of retrial or something because of uh, something about the jury uh, selection. But mm-hmm. as soon as they said, yeah, we'll do that, he died, so he never got any of that. Yep. Now, Carla, she shared her death row cell with Mountain View Unit with Ham Perillo, whose own sentence was eventually commuted to life in prison. Hmm. But yeah, between 1984 and 1982, requests for a retrial and appeals were denied. But on June 22nd, Carla requested that her life be spared on the basis that she was under the influence of drugs at the time of the murders. She wasn't lying. That's true, and she would not have committed the murders had she not taken the drugs, and she was now a reformed person. Right. And her plea... Drew support from abroad and also some leaders of American conservationism. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, among That's those, yeah, among those appealed mm. on the behalf of Bakray Wally Nade, the, the United Nations Commissioner on the Summary of uh, Arbitrary Executions and the World Councilor Churches, uh, Pope John Paul II. Well, that's big time. Yeah, even uh, spoke out on her behalf to have right. her uh, sentenced to life in prison instead of the death penalty. Pat Robertson, Ron Carlson. Ron Carlson was the brother of uh, Debbie Thornton. Yeah. One of her victims, and he spoke out against her. Yeah. Newt, the, Newt Gingrich yep. from the House of Representatives. So these people were trying to get her um, off the off death row. You know, even the DA who uh, sentenced her, you know, he was for it too. Yeah. And said that, uh, you know, nobody could do it, but Bush and Bush asked him what he thought. He goes, look, uh, I did my job. It's up to you, but uh, whatever you say, I'll go with. But, you know, he was, they were all convinced she was reformed. Yep. You know, she had been on there for 14 and a half years now. Yep. So that's not like she's just sitting there for a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Now, Debbie Thornton's husband was not on this list. <laughs> he definitely wanted her executed. Oh, yeah. Her husband wanted her dead. Yeah. No, I can't, I can't say that. I blame him. I mean, no, yeah. I mean, you know, and if you think about it, I wonder how much guilty he feels, you know, because they were in a fight and they got in a big fight and then that's when she left and then that's yeah. what happened. But so he's probably had a pretty rough time. Yeah. But it didn't happen. She didn't get. Um, no. Mm-mm. And uh, George W. Bush, he was the governor of Texas at the time. And mm-hmm. he said, no, it's a, it's a left up to a higher power. Yep. And he will not. Uh, she did what she did. Yep. That's it. So on uh, February the 2nd, 1988, the state authorities took Carla Fay from the unit in Gatesville, Texas, and flew her uh, by airplane 
and they transported her to Huntsville Unit in Huntsville. And Carla Faye's last meal uh, consisted of a banana, peach, a garden salad with ranch dressing. Hmm. Not me. And she <laughs> I want a steak nah, or something. I it. <laughs> and she selected five people to watch her die, hmm. including Thornton's husband Richard and his two two stepchildren, who supported the death penalty. Yeah. And Thornton's brother Ronald Carlson, who opposed the execution and had been converted to her by her faith after visiting her on death row. Yeah, they didn't stay in. They didn't sit in the same room. They had different rooms, you know, for people who wanted her, and then and then people who they were supporter, like yeah. her husband, you know. Yep. So he sat in there, and I think that's probably one of the only times that somebody who was, you know, close to the the per, the victim would actually sit in the other room to support who was being killed. Yeah, it's crazy. But they put her in on the in the execution room, and they put her on the t- strapped her in the table. And her last words were, Yes, sir, I would like to say to all of you, the Thornton family and Jerry Dean's family, that I am so sorry. I hope God will give you peace with this. And she looked at her husband and said, Baby, I love you. And she looked at Ronald Carlson and said, Ron, give Peggy a hug for me. And she looked at all present weeping and smiling. Everyone has been so good to me. I love all of you very much. I am going to be face to face with Jesus now. Warden Baggett, thank all of you so much. You have been so good to me. I love all of you very much. I will see you when you get there. I will wait for you. Wow. And she was executed by lethal injection. As the lethal chemicals were administered, she was praising Jesus. And eight minutes after receiving the injection, she was pronounced dead at 6.45 p.m. Hmm. And Dale, she was the first woman executed in the state of Texas in 135 years. Mm, since, what, 1863 or something? Yep, yeah. and she was the second female to be executed in the United States since the reinstatement of the death penalty. In 1976. Yep. Yep. And the first woman was Velma Barfield. Yep, we know and, her, right? Yep, we covered her in episode number 37. Yeah, go if, check that out. If you want to go check that out. Now, a year after Carla's execution, uh, Tucker Carlson questioned uh, Governor George W. Bush about how the Board of Pardons and Parole had arrived at termination on her clemency plea. And Carlson alleged that Bush, alluding to a televised interview which Carla Faye Tucker had given to a talk show Larry King, smirked and spoke mockingly about her. And Bush himself later denied this, and a full-length movie was released in 2004 about the life of Carla Fay, entitled Forevermore, and it was starring actress Karen Jezak. Hmm. So go check that out too. But pretty interesting. Yeah. But she turned her life around and got right with the Lord while yeah. in prison. And then whether she was faking it or whether she wasn't, she, it didn't seem like it. But, you know, it doesn't make up for what she did. You know, she took away all them, them people and messed up a lot of families. Yep. But her cellmate... Uh, did get right the Lord too, and she got her yeah uh, conviction commuted to life in prison, right? Instead of death row. So I don't know. Some people say that she may have tried that just to just to save herself. Yeah, yeah. You know, when they were given um, the sentencing, they didn't have a choice of life without the possibility of parole. It was either life or death. So that's when they went ahead and with the. Uh, with Texas law, you know, it was pretty much it had to be capital punishment. Yep. With what she did, being it was a you know murder of two two people during a burglary or something like that. It was they have a certain statutes. Yeah, it was a terrible crime. And yeah. I mean, no doubt about it, whether she was on drugs or not, it was right. it was still a terrible. Yeah, crime. and you hate it, you know. Like I said, you know, this girl probably hadn't had a clear head since she was twelve years old. No. You know, and could have been such a good person. Like you know, if she would she had been raised by anybody but her parents. You know, you probably would never even be doing the story, but as it is, it I don't know. A lot of people speculate on what they would do. Would you save her? Would you not? How would you do? But I don't know. I guess it's just whatever your opinion is on the death penalty, and we'll just leave it at that, I guess. Yep. It's all up to interpretation. Yep. Well, that's the story of Carla Faye Tucker. The pickaxe murderer. Yep. All right, Dale. We are going to get out of here. All right, man. Let's roll. We want everyone to be safe. Be careful and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is 
the Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles.